Hey, this is Ryan of Happy Healthy Vegan. So a question I get asked quite often during my live streams is, what are my thoughts of raw vegans and raw fruitarian diets? Do I think they're good, bad, are they helpful? And I'll give you my two cents here. It's more than two cents because I'm gonna be basing this video, as I always do, on facts and science and evidence. And that's my issue with raw vegan, raw fruitarian diets is that they're severely lacking in those areas, even though they do they pretend like they have science and facts backing them. As we'll see, it's just all kind of like truthiness. It kind of sounds good, but when you get down to it, there's no facts supporting their, the claims of their influencers. And that's who I'm taking issue with here. If you are on a raw vegan or fruitarian and diet and it's working out for you and it makes your life better awesome I have no issues with you whatsoever in fact I have a few a few not too many but a few long-term raw food as friends and they're cool people so like I said my issue is not with individuals in the raw food movement it is with the leaders and influencers who state all these grand claims that are supported by zero fact zero evidence like people like me eating cooked food are gonna be all unhealthy all you'll see the nonsense what I did here is I found a video of someone who I thought presented many of these raw fruitarian views I don't even know who he is I'm sure he's a good person here I think his name is sweet natural living and this is not an attack video on him I just picked him out because he had a pretty decent video summarizing some some of these unsupported, unscientific views of raw fruitarians. So cooking food is something that's uh, very common these days, right? These days, if you count at least several hundred thousand years as these days. But of course, all of the animals on the planet eat a raw food diet. They eat strictly raw food. So let me just stop you right there before we go any further. I already know where this is going. I've read 801010 by Doug Graham. I've seen countless videos by raw food leaders and you're bringing out here the appeal to nature fallacy. This is like a textbook use of it. Yeah, all animals in nature eat raw food. Why are humans the only one that doesn't? What's in nature is right. That's the fallacy of the appeal to nature fallacy. The assumption that if something happens in nature, it is right, it is what we ought to do. And that just simply not the case. I mean, if you really followed the what happens in nature, humans must do also, you wouldn't be on a computer, you'd never travel by car, you would poop outdoors. I mean, there's so many things that would follow if you truly believed in this principle of following what happens in nature. Every species on the planet, including humans, have a diet to which they're biologically adapted to eating. And so for millions of years, we, our ancestors anyway, ate what was available to them, uh, edible in its natural state. You know, we couldn't really go around eating roots and tubers when we didn't cook. We had to rely on the foods that were edible in its natural state. And the only thing that really, you know, fits that description for humans anyway, is fruit. So it's really common to see raw vegans and fruitarians talk about this species specific diet that happens to be all raw that we've been eating for millions of years. We humans, well, it's just completely untrue. It just shows a complete lack of understanding of science and anthropology. Us, our species, Homo sapien, has only been around a couple hundred thousand years. We haven't been around for millions of years. If you want to talk about creatures from millions of years ago, yeah, there's Australopithecus, which died out maybe a, a couple million years ago. How far back do you want to go? Like uh, one of my raw vegan friends here from Los Angeles, Mark Tassie, liked to talk about this creature from about 11 million years ago. Humans subsisted chiefly on fruit for many millions of years. And humans have been here for 18 million years. So yes, Dryopithecus existed about 10, 11 million years ago, eating nothing but all raw food. However, it doesn't really resemble a human being all that much. It's an ape technically, but it resembles a monkey. I just find it completely disingenuous that raw foodists will say this monkey-like creature from 11 million years ago, who's really small, has a body and physiology and brain nothing like ours, that's the diet that we should all be eating exactly like. Eating a raw food diet is the optimal. A raw, tropical fruit diet 
is what we're adapted to eating. I mean, according to the timeline that's accepted by science, this is complete misinformation. And I'm not blaming this particular YouTuber for it. He's just repeating the stuff he's heard from the raw food leaders, but Homo sapiens have only been around a couple hundred thousand years. And by then, we had already started cooking starchy tubers. In fact, that started maybe one and a half, two million years ago with Australopithecus. I'll link to the video I made about this. I referred to books and works by Harvard primatologists Richard Wrangham. So my point though is that when you have raw food it's like this saying that we have the species specific diet and it's raw fruit. This is completely wrong. Yeah, there is a raw specific diet for human ancestors that existed millions of years ago, but by the time Homo sapiens arrived on the scene, we were already cooking food. And when we cook the food, we change the chemical nature of that food. This is obvious. This is, this is the whole point of cooking. Breaking down cell walls, making it softer, more digestible in that sense. Actually making food more digestible isn't a bad thing, as he's trying to make it sound like there. It's a, it's a process of breaking down, which is part of why, you know, it's not a good idea. Ideally, you want to eat foods that your body can break down itself, like a papaya. Easy to break down. So that sounds like a biological claim. So that's something that should be known by science. And I've yet to see any study that backs up what's being said here, that if your body breaks a food down, that's good somehow. And if you have to break it down via cooking, like, you know, there's gonna be digestion later on too, but if you have to cook the food to help with digestion, that's somehow bad or unhealthy. If you have to break down the foods prior to eating them by cooking, this should already tell you something. You're already eating now something that you're you're not really adapted to eating. All right, so we're back to the whole species specific diet and when we're adapted to eating. And like I said, we've been adapted to eating to cook food for at least a million or so years, particularly the entire time that our species, Homo sapien, has been around. Your body has evolved over a long time to need specific nutrients and to be adapted to getting those specific nutrients in a specific ratio, in a specific balance. Right? As we all know, omega-3, for example, we all hear, should ideally be in a one-to-one -one ratio with omega-6. Well, if you're eating fruit, lots of fruit, even some greens, you will have a perfect one-to-one -one ratio of omega-6 to omega-3. As soon as you start eating all kinds of other foods, though, you get way too much omega-6, which is, means your conversion of omega-3 will not be as efficient, you got a problem. Well, there are some nutritional claims that can easily be fact-checked, and let's see if what he's saying is actually true. And I want to emphasize, I didn't like cherry-pick here, no pun intended, about fruits, but I just used some of the fruits and foods he was talking about and foods that I eat all the time and see if this omega-3 to omega-6 ratio is really true. You get this perfect one-to-one -one ratio of threes to sixes, as he claims here. So let's take a look here at mangoes, which he said is, you know, a perfect fruit. And its omega-3 to 6 ratio is not even one-to-one. -one. The omega-3 is about a three-to-one, and that's actually probably not a bad thing, but he said a one-to-one -one ratio is ideal. So I'll take him at his word here. And bananas are not even close to having that ideal one-to-one -one ratio of omega-3s to 6s. 0.92 to 1.57, so it's much higher in omega-6s. So now let's compare these raw foods to some of these horrible, evil cook foods and see how whack the omega-3 to 6 ratio. And again, I'm not cherry picking. These were the first two foods I picked. I thought of, what do I eat all the time? Potatoes. Potatoes, omega-3s are higher than omega-6s just because there are no omega-6s in potatoes, but it seems like the ratio ain't that bad. And next I looked at black beans because I eat legumes all the time. And and of all the foods I looked at, black beans are the closest to having a one-to-one -one ratio of omega-3s to 6s. So my point of going through this example here was not to say raw foods suck and cooked foods are awesome. It was to show that not all fruits, as he claimed, have this near-perfect one-to-one -one ratio of omega-3s to 6s, while also showing that some very common, horrible, evil cooked foods have a pretty darn good ratio by his standards. So you see how starting to eat foods that we're not adapted to starts causing problems. We have to try and sort of figure out how to make up for it. But really the only way to truly make up for it is to start to eliminate those foods that we're not meant to be eating. For me, this is one of the biggest problems I have with these recommendations from raw fruitarian authors, leaders, and influencers. How he said here, how you have to eliminate all these foods that, we, that weren't meant to be eaten by us, like say legumes, which is completely ridiculous. There's absolutely zero reason to eliminate legumes from your diet. I've yet to see a single study that shows if you eat legumes, you're at increased risk of say, 
dying of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, or stroke. To the contrary, there's studies that show that high consumption of legumes is associated with lower risk of all-cause mortality, meaning those who eat lots of legumes tend to live longer. So this is just completely bogus advice. I mean, it's potentially harmful advice to tell people to not eat these perfectly healthy foods that are associated with living a long, healthy life. So the problem with eating foods that we're not biologically adapted to eating is that A, they do have a different nutrient profile, as I just said. You know, they might be uh, low in some nutrients, like when you're talking about grains, for example, they, they lack in, in a fair bit of nutrients that are needed for human health, that are present in fruit. So if you're just living on grains, mm, you're gonna be missing out on a few nutrients. If you're just living on grains, like who in the world is suggesting that people just subside solely on grains? This is just ridiculous. I, I know in the raw food world, there's this concept known as mono eating. I've seen people eat nothing but, I seriously eat oranges for like two months, nothing but oranges. So maybe he's thinking non-raw vegans will mono rice or something like that, which is, I've never seen a person do that. So this is just a bad example he's bringing up here. In fact, let's look at the official position of the Academy of Nutrition and dietetics, which say vegan diets are appropriate and healthful for people in all phases of life. But notice how they say here, appropriately planned, meaning eating a balanced vegan diet, not just eating one food for an extended period of time. If you're living on all fruit though, you're not really missing out on anything. It's all there. Again, not necessarily true, especially if you're monoing a single fruit for an extended period of time. It made it sound like, hey, as long as you're eating fruit, any kind of fruit, you're going to be good. And that's just simply harmful advice. Particularly, are we even concerned about vitamin B12? I mean, he made it sound like if you eat fruit, all your nutritional needs are covered. You won't need to take any supplement ever. No vitamin D, no vitamin B12. Fruit solves all your nutritional needs, and it just simply doesn't. So... Uh, by eating foods that we're not adapted to eating, we're getting not enough of some nutrients and we're getting too much of other nutrients. This is a problem. Could that possibly be even more vague? Notice how there was no mention of any specific nutrients that we get too much of or too little of if we're eating this horrible cooked food. The other problem with eating foods that we're not adapted to is that there might be so-called anti-nutrients present. Phytates is one of the most you know, well-known uh, anti-nutrients present, especially in grains and legumes that inhibit the absorption of other important nutrients. Oxalic acid is another one it's present in spinach even. You know, it limits the uptake of, of, of iron, of, of, of uh, calcium. Oh yes, the dreaded anti-nutrients, and I've seen proponents of the carnivore diet also bring this up. So who are you going to believe? People who are lacking actual science, or would you say maybe believe the word of, like, say, actual science, like the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, and let's look at what they say about anti-nutrients, and they say they can be removed from your food if you do any of the number following things, which we do to, say, legumes, which have these horrible anti-nutrients, such as soaking them, sprouting them, which I typically don't, or boiling them. So basically, cooking food deactivates most of these anti-nutrients that raw vegans are worried so much about. Before I go, I want to say I actually have no problem with eating raw food myself. I probably have about maybe a quarter to one third of my diet as raw food. I begin every day with a workout and then I have about maybe eight to 900 calories of bananas and blueberries. And I actually tried a fully raw vegan diet back in 2012, was it? I went vegan in 2010. So yeah, I've had some personal experience with it so I can speak firsthand. And I found there was actually no benefits. I didn't feel any healthier. My blood tests weren't any better or anything like that. That. It just seems like extra work, extra effort, and, and like I said, my biggest problem is eliminating perfectly fine, healthy foods. I mean, I couldn't imagine like never eating a potato again. And again, there's no reason to give up potatoes for the rest of your life. There's they're not associated with increased risk of death or leading causes of death, anything like that. So it just seems like an unnecessarily restrictive diet, which is ultimately harder to do. So anyway, leave your questions and comments down below. Let me know if you have any experience with raw vegan diets. Let let me know if you've been doing it a long time and it's working out for you. All I ask though is guys, you can be raw as, raw as you want, like I said, but please don't represent it as being this diet that's based in anthropology and science and facts. It's severely lacking in that, but if you enjoy it, if it makes you feel good, then keep on doing it and just keep it at that, guys. So anyway, comment, like, share this video, and until next time, guys, let's keep it vegan. Cooked food is not evil. A wind is
through pain. 